just now. Oh, Lord, it's in the power just now. Oh, Lord, it's in the power just now. And baptize everyone. It's the soul time power was given to our fathers who were true. It is promised to be. in the power just now oh lord's in the power just now and baptize everyone oh lord's in the power oh lord's in the power just now baptize by our Lord. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. Oh, Lord, send the power. Hey, hey, hey Lord, the power just now and baptize everyone. Doug, you like that song, don't you? Yeah, you had your own personal rapture and drum solo there at the end, didn't you, buddy? All right. <laughs> I'll play a little more of it just so we can play it. All right, here we go. Oh, Lord, send the power. Oh, Lord, send the power. Oh, Lord, send the power just now and baptize everyone. Yes, this old time power was given to our fathers who were true. It is promised to be believers that we all may have it too. Oh, Lord, send the power. Oh, Lord, send the power. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. And baptize everyone. <laughs> Y'all give the Lord a good praise offering. Oh, I have never seen a young man want to play an instrument in the house of the Lord so much as Doug Jr. And uh he keeps telling me because I think he's afraid I'm going to kick him off the drums one of these days. But I'm not going to, but I have been praying for the Lord to help you, son. Just trust me. Mr. Pastor Chip, his, his, Uncle Chip is praying for you to get better and better. You may be seated. Let me talk about that with you for just a second. I, I grew up in church here. Oh, can, can we just have fun being in the presence of the Lord? I don't get to see you people, but once a week, and that's for about an hour and 30 minutes, and then we're back and forth on Facebook or phone calls and this and that. But for the most part, we don't have time to be together fellowshipping with one another. And so for those of you that are home right now, I know we've got a few people that are out with COVID right now that can't be here this morning. And so you go, well, that's a different style for Pastor Jim. It's a little bit different. Because I usually have my shirt on, right? So uh, we decided to go over to Alma's because they had the youth function yesterday. How many of you came to the youth function yesterday? Uh, passed by, you knew about it, saw it. Well, we had a good time. We really did. We had a good time. Anyway, so uh, we picked out our outfits, and we decided we were going to stay on this side of the lake over at Alma's house. So uh, I got up this morning, and there's my shirt all laid out, and Joanne's got her dress all laid out, and we're going to match. We're going to look nice today, right? And then I went to button my shirt. (laughs) 
Mr. Pastor Chip's doing a good job of being healthy right now because I can't get it. <laughs> button. I buttoned it up and I looked like a waiter in a gay bar or something. <laughs> don't, don't wear that to church. You know how they wear the shirt one size too small and the button's about to pop off of it and everything? I was like, oh, no, 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 no. We better not wear that. Uh, so uh, I didn't know what to do, and I thank God I had this undershirt with me. And I said, well, what does this look like? And I was like, well, that looks nice. That's good. And Joanna, she just looked at me. And he goes, well, you don't really have a choice, do you? I said, it's either this or the black fishing shirt I wore yesterday. So we went ahead and opted for this outfit. But back to Doug Jr. again. <laughs> I have played, and I've been in church all my life, and I've played with some really, really professional musicians. These people, I mean... I, I, the last project that I did, I don't, I, let me tell you, is it all right if I tell y'all some stuff without it sounding wrong? But we all from the West Bank, right? I'm from West Wego. I'm down there by the tracks. That's where I grew up, on the railroad tracks. You know where I'm talking about. Anybody from West Wego? The church parsonage was from here to the back wall from the railroad tracks. That's where I grew up, on the railroad tracks. So sometimes things that the Lord has blessed me with, I'm totally fascinated. It's not bragging. I promise you, it's I can't believe it. How did I wind up there? How did I wind up in Los Angeles at 16 years old on television with the lead guitar player from Alice Cooper, Rockin' Reggie Vinson, on television around the world? 16 years old. I don't know how that happened. But in playing with all these great musicians, I remember uh, when we... We, see, we used to have an organ that was, uh, was, uh, was a, it was a Catholic organ. That's the best way I can describe this organ, right? It was a Catholic organ. Hey, anyway, hold on a second. I'll help you out with it. And you'll, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about once I show it to you. It's, uh, it's probably more like this. Or maybe a funeral home organ. <laughs> and so that's, I grew up in church with this. Well, we had the organ player, and, uh, you know, it was hard to find musicians that could play in church. And when we first moved to West Wego, we didn't have any musicians. That's how we all learned how to play was because my dad had built-in musicians and a built-in choir. And so you were going to learn one way or another, if you know what I mean. And so uh, my sisters were a lot more compliant in this whole thing about learning how to play the piano and stuff. But I remember we used to have an organ player. And I won't say the, the name because the people are still affiliated with the church and there's some of the families that founded the church from back in the day. And, uh, and so one sister played the organ really well, but she went off to Southwestern College. And the younger sister knew how to play well also, but she didn't always feel like coming to church. And I remember the pastor's house on a Saturday evening, about 6 o'clock all the way on, was making two or three phone calls to make sure that this organ player was going to show up in church. And on some weeks, I don't know how I'm feeling. You're 18 years old. You want to talk about how I'm feeling? I turned 60 this year. I not turned... I'm gonna. I ain't there yet, so don't be throwing stones at me, people. Don't be. Somebody send me a little smarty pants on Facebook, a little message. Here you're turning sixty this year, and an old gray-headed man with a beard. I went. That's horrible for you to send that to me. And then I looked in the mirror and I thought, well, <laughs> I'm looking more and more like Ray Brown every day. <laughs> I'm just playing with you, brother. <laughs> oh, man. And so she would do that every week. And my dad couldn't pick out the songs for the service 
because he didn't know if she was going to be there or not. There were some times when we first moved into the 4th Street in West Wego, 1963, 65, right in there when I can really begin to remember. All we had was a tambourine and my dad. Wangity bang, bang, bang. Sounded like Doug. <laughs> I'm just playing with you, nephew. You know I'm messing with you. All right. But uh, my dad would be up there. So then we, we, we didn't do too good with just a tambourine. So we used to, do y'all remember Sister Kinsey? Yeah. All right, Sister Kinsey, she was old ever since I knew her because I was so little. No, I, I didn't mean that ugly. I mean, when you're three years old, everybody's old. Right. I, I heard a story about my stepson. He was, he was four years old, and he went over and told his mom and his grandma, and he said, back in the day, back in the day, you four. There is no back in the day. <laughs> back in the day, you were, you were in the nursery. That's not old. Paul, oh, man, that's my favorite one, Paul, sitting there watching me change Christian's clothes. Why don't you change my clothes anymore, Doug? I said, baby, you're big. You're grown. You can do that yourself. I wish I was two again so I wouldn't have to live this old, hard life I live. <laughs> Some things never change, people. Some things never change. I ain't going to talk about my son just because he's not here. <laughs> and anyway, so we started the rhythm band. And Sister Kenza, she was going to help the church, you know, because her husband was a head deacon. So he's going to, he's going to, we have had some times. And so uh, Dawn, uh, she, I don't remember what Dawn played. She might have played the tambourine. Y'all want to know what my first instrument was? Anybody care? The triangle. Ding. <laughs> I was two. I have a picture of it. Me with my triangle. That's how I got started. But by the time I was five, my dad did see the potential of a piano player in the church. And so by the time I was five, my mother started teaching me little things on the piano. You know, I wasn't proficient or anything like that. I was, what do they call those guys that are protégés or whatever, prodigies? Or, I was far from that, and I played chopsticks. Come on. But I still got there. Anyway, the older I got, I turned 10 years old, and that's when I discovered that my dad had a very long belt. And I would be playing football in the front yard, and he would come get me. Time to practice for one hour. I would kick and scream all the way in the door. And he, more than one time, he, Susan True, Owen, he met me at the door with the belt. And y'all know my dad was a man of girth. He was big. And that belt dragged the floor, even after he rolled it up a little bit. And he just looked at me, and my mother said, get in here. And I go in there, but I hated fooling around with that piano. But y'all don't know why. Because people in the church were just flat out mean. They would come up to me, and they would say, you play just like Liberace. I was only 10, and I knew. I may wear a few extra rings, but that's not because I'm like Liberace. I'm Chipperace. <laughs> so you're probably saying, where does this story go? The best sermons that I've ever heard are the ones that carry a testimony. The best sermons I've ever been able to apply to my life is when I hear somebody went through some trash in their life and then I look at it and go, maybe I can make it because they made it. The, the test provides the testimony. The mess provides the message. And if you ain't never been through a mess, you ain't got a message. And if you've never been through the test, you don't have a testimony. You have to have been down the road of life for me to even begin to listen to what's going on that you, you tell me you know. How many of you thought you knew everything when you were 13, 15, 17? Didn't you think your parents were just so stupid? 
And now that you are a certain age, you go, they weren't nearly as dumb as I thought they were. They Thank you. Give Vincent a big round of applause. But it only serves to illustrate the point. I had no idea the microphone was going to go out this morning. Now, if I don't know what to do when the microphone goes off, if that had never happened to me before, we'd all be standing here, sitting here, looking at one another, going, oh, no, the microphone, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? I'll make something up. At this age, I'll make stuff up. <laughs> I had a kid. He, comes, he, he came to church. He came not long ago. He used to take Bible class, and I was the Bible teacher. And, uh, and I would give him the memory verse. And... Uh, all right, then we have the test. Write down the memory verse. I, I, and I complimented him about a month ago. I called him. I said, uh, when you were a kid in school, I'll never forget you. He, he said, why? I said, because you're the only student that I ever had that actually made up the Bible. <laughs> I said, that is not John 3.16, but you made up some eloquent words. That, he was good at making up stuff. But, you know, thou shalt eat thy cereal in the morning before thou shalt go to school. <laughs> he came up with some serious stuff. you got to learn how to improvise in this life if you're ever going to get anywhere. And if you want to take a few notes, this is actually a sermon. It's a message. It's, it comes from the mess that this life is. Probably one of the most significant things that anyone ever told me was it was an old Indian guy. Oh, Oh, I said that wrong. American native. Should I say it? <laughs> well, it's Cain's fault. He sang it last night. He said, what makes the red man red? I said, they had to take that out of the Disney movie. Because everybody gets their feelings hurt about everything. You don't even know. Y'all don't even want to know what we called each other when I was growing up. What did you call one another? We called each other everything under the sun. Where do you think some of the terminology comes from nowadays? Because we picked on what we played. We, we had to improvise our way all the way through life. We couldn't cuss. Am I right? Sister Lopez in the back back there, but Larry taught me how. Yes, he did. Him and Daryl Dufresne out behind the church on the railroad tracks taught me how to say my bad words. Send me back home to my mama, and I would get whipped because I said the words that they sent me home. Sunday school, nothing. It was Sunday school, all right. I learned a whole lot of things. You tell Larry I said it. I ain't scared. Tell Gerald, too. <laughs> Gerald won't come to church, won't watch on TV, neither one, because he's afraid I'm going to rat him out. I got more stories than just this one. Whew, them boys were bad. <laughs> they taught me how to jump out of the bathroom in the, at the old building. I was six. They taught me how to jump out of the bathroom and go and play pinball at the Little General across the way. But somehow in the middle of all of that mess, watch this, we would have revival services that would knock your socks off. Some, like maybe because we had sinned just before church. I don't know, Ray. 
We all felt guilty no matter what it was. You knew you were going to hell. Am I right? Anybody grow up over there? You, you knew you were going to hell when you walked in. Because if you didn't know it, my dad let you know it pretty quick. He preached hell, fire, and brimstone. Yeah, it was that old-fashioned preaching. And you didn't know if you were going to heaven or not at the end of the day. But everybody prayed all the time so they wouldn't. Now everybody thinks everybody's getting in and nobody ever prays. Oh, I'm good. No, you ain't. See, you have to learn how in this life to start improvising because it, the microphone batteries are going to go out or maybe life's just going to take a left turn when you thought it was going to take a right turn and everything that you were banking on changes all of a sudden. What are you going to do? Where are you going to, how are you going to, I don't know. What? See, that's why Jesus said this. Listen to me, and this is Pentecost Sunday. He said, I'm going to send you the comforter. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to teach you all things. He's going to help you improvise. Yeah. See, because you don't know what to do. He even tells us not to really study too hard ahead of time when we go before the magistrates or before the judges and things like that to defend our faith. He says, don't, don't think too much because the Spirit of God is going to move on you in that moment. And you're going to be filled with the words that come from the mess you've been through and the test that you've been through. And you will have a message and a testimony. Amen. And so we look here in Acts, the first chapter, and it says... The disciples, were, they, they were good men just like all of us. They, they were human beings just like all of us. And the thing about it is they would get ahead of themselves. Have you ever gotten ahead of yourself? Like uh, you wanted to know what you got for Christmas on January 15th? Uh, you're a year ahead of time. You're not in step. I remember asking my dad one time, it was Christmas night. And I said, Dad, he said, what, baby? I said, how long is it till next Christmas? <laughs> I already had the catalog out, and I didn't get everything I wanted this year. So I was banking on next year, thinking I might get it then. <laughs> Verse 6 says this. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> he says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Listen to this. The distinction is drawn very clearly for the people that don't believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Trinity. Here's Jesus speaking about the Father. Two different personalities, the same God, the Lord your God is one God. All right, you see, that which the Father hath put in his own power. So Jesus obviously is the Son. And now he says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in the Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. These are the things that are going to happen in our lives. We are going to testify. We are going to be the witnesses. We are going to carry the message of the gospel when we are in these moments. That we have to spread the gospel wherever we may be. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You shall be witnesses. A lot of times people aren't witnesses. And there's a reason. Uh, we all have personalities. Some are quiet. Some are shy. Some are uh, very reserved. I know it's probably hard for any of you to believe that I was ever shy. But I was when I was about two. <laughs> I'll talk to a fly on the wall. I don't care. It doesn't bother me anymore. Yeah. Romans, the first chapter, the 16th verse, it says this. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm proud to be a Christian. And it's Pride Month, and I don't see why I can't be proud of living for Jesus. We're becoming a very rare breed being discriminated against. I'm going to start one of the, one of the leagues for the, against the defamation of Christianity. The Anti-Defamation League for everything else under the sun. Good grief. Now you can't even be proud to be a child of God. You got to hang your head in shame like you did something wrong. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I almost put that on my Facebook page. But look, you know, one time I put something up just because I was clowning around. Y'all know how I am. I put something up there, and it was Justin Wilson. And he, had, he showed them the difference between a male crab and a female crab. I thought it was funny. Down in Cajun land, we can tell a difference. Between a male crab and a female crab. Let's flip them over. Take a look. You got it figured out yet? I'm being really careful what I say right now because all the wokeness is going to come at me, but I really don't care. Did you know I put that up playfully and I lost over 50 friends on Facebook? Bam, right out the window. And I couldn't find the friends that I had in the first place. I thought they just liked rainbows. I didn't know why they had rainbows all over their page. I'm not making fun of anybody. And I, would, I, I feel strongly about this because I feel like the church has got to say something. And everybody's scared to say something. They're afraid somebody's going to say something back at them. Get over it. A man is a man. A woman is a woman. And in America, look, you got a right to be whoever it is you want to be. But when you stand before God, you better be ready. That's all I'm going to tell you. You're going to tell God when you stand before him, you made a mistake. I'm really a woman. I don't think so. I don't think anybody's going to have the nerve. I'm going to be trembling so bad, just me. I'm scared to go. I want to go to heaven, but there's a little part of me that kind of wants to watch y'all there first. <laughs> I want to see. I want to see if there's not an alternative somewhere where I can maybe wait in purgatory until he gets done with all of y'all. And I find out how y'all did, then I'll go present myself before the throne. Because <laughs> if some of y'all make it, I know I'm good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, Tracy made it. I, if, if, if Tracy made it, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to walk up behind her. I'm going to stand there. And, nope, nope did not wait. I'll wait for four more people to see what happens. <laughs> Maybe God will get tired. <laughs> you know, growing up in a family with five kids, you always wanted to be the last one to get the whipping. Because by that time, he was tired. <laughs> he didn't care no more. And Kathy, I got to tell you all this when I'm telling personal stuff, but Kathy, she wouldn't cry for nothing. I am woman, hear me roar. Whatever. My dad started loosening his belt. I started squealing like a little pig. Oh, oh it hurts. <laughs> I haven't even hit you yet. <laughs> I know, but I can feel it already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. I got to write that in a book somewhere. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to stand over there in the corner and watch y'all get judged, and then I might sneak out. And, okay, here I am. Good grief. But no matter what you... <laughs> no, matter, no matter what you've been through, no matter what your mess, no matter what your test, you still got to be what God called you to be. You don't think that Peter thought about it? Because this is right after the resurrection. And he had to think, man, just a couple of months ago, I betrayed Jesus. 
You don't think that crossed his mind? More than one time. Even Paul the Apostle, after he had met Jesus on the road to Damascus, after all the stuff that he had done, he talks about himself in several different passages in the epistles, and mainly in, in, in Timothy, 1 Timothy, the first chapter, and in other places. He says, I am the least worthy to stand up here and preach the gospel. Now, this was a man that prayed in the spirit. This was a man that gave guidance to the churches under the guidance of the Holy Ghost. And yet he would stand up to teach and preach and tie in all of the prophecies of the Old Testament in with all the fulfillments in the New Testament. And yet he still had to deal with his own downfalls, his own failures, his own shame of having killed Christians and been responsible for all of those that had been persecuted. He did it out of ignorance. He didn't understand. But it didn't change the fact that he felt horrible about himself. And this is one of the reasons that we, as the body of Christ, have got to move beyond who we used to be so that God can use who we are now. 2 Timothy 5.17 says, I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Why do you think Paul the Apostle said those types of things? The best sermons I've ever preached in my life are the ones that I'm kind of preaching to myself just a little bit. And sometimes even more than just a little bit. Because what I'm going through is what I'm preaching from but I also identify that that's what you're going through as well. And if you want to know, I got enough people that would tell me I got no right to be on this platform in the first place. But when I look at their lives, I feel a whole lot better. Don't start throwing stones my way because there'll be a few flying back at you. And I don't have to be the one who does it. Jesus will just kneel down in the sand and he'll start saying all the stuff that you did, like he did with the Pharisees. Nobody liked the Pharisees. The general public, they were the, they were the politicians. They were the lawyers of that time. You, you think that they were the, the, like the preachers and the, the pastors and things like that because they called them the high priest, but they were actually the lawyers. They judged you. No. <laughs> you just, you, the batteries go out. People preach back at me. Oh, yeah. When are we going to start the choir again? You think I forget that, you little smarty pants over there? Keep hollering at me. <laughs> I just tease it with you. I don't know where it comes from, but it's over there somewhere. Now, see, that's, I love this church because it comes from over there and everybody's looking around like they didn't do it. It must be Libby. Must be her. Well, that's part of what makes this church special, though. You do know that, right, is that everybody just feels like they came to the family reunion when they come. They, you don't feel like you got to sit there and you can't say nothing. You say something, I'll say something back. I'll talk about your mama. <laughs> but those things that we're ashamed of are the things that God wants to use in our lives to be an example of how God can actually change you and encourage people that need to make those changes. Uh, one of the compliments that I had uh, after Polly passed away was one of the, we had a lot of deaths, uh, spouse, uh, widows and widowers in the church right after that. And on several occasions, people would come and say, I watch you because if you can make it, I know I'm going to make it too. Well, I got to make it. I, I, people say, well, I'm so proud of you for what? I have no choice. I am an example of how God takes something that's completely imperfect, uses it for his glory. All the mistakes, all the downfalls, all the disappointments, 
are right there for you to look at and to see. And if I'm making it, you better make it. You got to make it too. If I got to keep on fighting the good fight of faith, then you got to keep on fighting the good fight of faith. Do I feel like quitting sometimes? Everybody feels that way sometimes. You just throw your hands in the air and you say, gas is going to be $6 a gallon by the end of the summer. I'm already eating crackers and butter. Must be a lot of it, too, because this shirt don't fit. <laughs> you need to, that's, that's the problem there, Brother Chip. You need to lay off the crackers and the butter. <laughs> Get you some healthy fried chicken. <laughs> Go to Popeye's on my diet. It's about being used of God. That's what God was, that's what Jesus was saying. The Father's got all these things set in his own time, but you shall receive the Holy Ghost and you will receive power to become the witnesses that God has called you to be. Now, this, this transcends whether or not you're shy or your personality type or your gifting, or your ability to speak. We have an example of all of these things all the way throughout Scripture. The point that I'm trying to make, Doug, is that God is going to equip you. You're not where you're going to be. You're not where you used to be. Oh, did I want to throw a stick or two at you every once in a while on a Sunday? Praise the Lord. And I just say, Doug... But God's bringing him to another place in his abilities and in his talents. We are all works in progress. And as we get better and better and more and more proficient, people say, oh, well, how did you get to be so good at the piano? Oh, God gifted you so much. Oh, shut up. My daddy gifted me so much with that big old long belt and threatening my existence. So Sister Kenzie, we started out with the little triangle thing. And then one Sunday, she was sitting in the back, and I was like, <laughs> wrong sound for sure. I, thought, I, wrote, I wrote this one. I was like, ah, um. <laughs> nope, not yet. Are you getting too confident over there, Doug? <laughs> Can I get a witness? What God's done for you? Can I get a witness? What God's done for you? Healed a broken body, touched you through and through. Can I get a witness? What God's done for you? My mother and Sister Kenzie would get together, and I wrote that song so long before all the other Can I Get a Witnesses came out. That's the first one. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sister Kenzie would say, You just got too much jip and jive, and jip and jive, jip and jive, jip and jive. Every song is jip and jive. My mother picked up on it. My mother would tell me that on a Sunday, jip and jive, jip and jive. At the time, I had a goatee, you know, and my mother would go, get that off of your face. You're too cute to wear. Get, to, get that off of there. I said, Mama, <laughs> she didn't like the goatees. <laughs> and so I just, uh, my dad said, I'll buy you an electric piano because I saw Andre Crouch in concert, and it was so cool. You know, he was sitting behind this electric piano in, in the early 70s. And that was when, you know, that was a cool look. You know, you didn't look like, even though I did cut my teeth on. <laughs> Boy, my, if y'all could have seen that, my mother took. And she took me straight to the gospel bookstore, and she bought me all of Andre Crouch's books that day because I, I was playing Benny and the Jets. She said, oh, that's a beautiful song, Jim. What's the name of it? 
<laughs> you could hear the theme from Dragnet, you know, da 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 da. And I'm going, how did she know I wasn't playing a Christian song? I found out decades later that Kathy ratted me out to my mama. <laughs> anyway. So I got the electric piano. And I, because I learned some songs. And, uh, and that's when the Lord started using me. I started traveling across the state. And then I travel across the country. I was only 12 when that started. And I see how God took this very imperfect beginning and started doing something with it throughout the course of my life. And if you can just for a moment look at your life and see that imperfect start. Be honest for just a second, huh? I, I know all of you mostly, and I know where you came from or what you were involved with. That's why you came to Jesus, because everything was wrong. Everything was falling apart. We don't all, who's better? Who, who, who's better here than anybody else in here? Nobody. If it weren't for the blood of Jesus, if it weren't for the blood of Jesus, then we'd all be on our way to hell. But I don't care what path you walk in this life, you better turn to Jesus. I, you can say whatever you want to say about your, your sexuality. You can say whatever you want to say about your politics. You can do, but the bottom line is you better get some Jesus on you. That's Because everything else, I, I, I don't know when we stand before God how he, he's the only righteous judge. There are going to be some people that were so religious and you think, oh, surely they're getting in. He said in Matthew, the seventh chapter, those are the ones that say, oh, well, we did many wondrous works in your name. And he'll say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Well, if they don't get in, who's getting in? Jesus gave an illustration of a publican and a sinner. And the publican, he went down and he smote his chest. The Pharisee, he went down and he said, oh, I thank you, God, that I'm not like that one. Well, he didn't leave justified. What means he didn't leave forgiven because all he did was looked at somebody else and said, I'm better than them. There's nobody in here better than anybody in here. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we get that through our thick skulls that we are no better than anybody else and we don't deserve to be any place anybody else does or doesn't deserve, then you can go before God with a humble spirit and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Who's worse, the person in immorality or the person who gossips about the person who's in immorality? It's all a sin. It will all send you to hell. I've had people say, you ought to preach against this and against that. Why? Why don't I preach against you? Why don't I preach about your little pet sin? Because gossip's right up there. Backbiting's right up there. Seditions, heresies. It's right in the mix with all the stuff we love to preach about. And point our fingers at others and say they shouldn't be like this. Well, we shouldn't any one of us be involved in those types of things. And it, if it weren't for the blood of Jesus, if it were not for what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, and the resurrection that the Father performed over that sinless life, we would none of us get in. But now, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Doesn't matter where you went last week or last night. Doesn't matter what happened in the past. It's a new day. It's a new season. God has do, he's doing a new thing in you. Paul preached such a good message last week about new seasons. One of my favorite scriptures is from Isaiah 43. I do a new thing. So 
So when you look at that and you realize we all, th there's something that has to happen to us, though. In conjunction with our salvation and confessing Christ, we have to be filled with the Spirit. You have to be filled with the Spirit. It says in the second chapter of the book of Acts, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place, in one accord. And I, I, I talk about this. But I'm only going to do it. I'm only going to do it briefly. And, and the reason for it is that you've heard me say it many times, but I'll say it again. There were 500 there on the day that Jesus ascended, but there were only 120 in the upper room. But Jesus told everybody, do not depart until you receive the gift. What happened to the others? Why didn't they stay where Jesus told them to stay? After they had already seen the resurrection and the ascension, they already saw the nail scars in his hand. Does, does it ever fascinate you that people come to Christ, serve the Lord, get discouraged or get fed up or get whatever, and they just decide to go live the way they used to live? How do you do that? You don't ever really truly do that. Because you can't live without the Spirit of God following you everywhere you go. And it says in verse 17, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. He wants to pour out His Spirit not only on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. You've heard that theology before, that it was only for back then. Boy, I'm going to tell you, if we don't need the Holy Ghost now, I don't know when you ever did. When people can't tell the difference between a man and a woman, I mean, you can, ha you can, for the sake of argument, you can say whatever you want to say about alternate lifestyles and things of that nature, but you can't argue about biology. I saw, I literally, I saw this past week. When are we going to say something about it? Oh, you're making me nervous, brother Chip. Stop it! It's me. I'll take the bullets. When are we going to stop this? I, I, saw, I saw a picture of a pregnant man. What? They, I, I pulled it. I looked at it. They, they are showing this to our kids that a man can get. How? Thank you. It says in the 22nd verse of Romans, the first chapter, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And if you don't know the difference between a man and a woman, <laughs> answer your own question on whether or not that's just plain ridiculous. Don't you know if men had to have babies, we would not have a human race. Can't even pass a kidney stone without dying. Much less an eight-pound baby. You out of your mind? They would have never got out the Garden of Eden. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Ain't going to be no kids going on around here. I make y'all so nervous sometimes. I can see it on your faces. Oh, please don't say anything stupid. Just please don't say anything. That ship sailed a long time ago. <laughs> but it says here in Acts, the second chapter, the fourth verse, watch what it says. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit of God gives you utterance. Now, here are just a few things that hinder people, not Let's go down a little list. It's a, it's a short list. Number one, they don't believe. If you don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you won't receive it. So, I mean, that's self-explanatory. That's self-evident that you can't have if you're not going to believe for it. The second is somewhere in a balance of embarrassment, but see, I don't speak in tongues to be heard speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues because that's my prayer language. If I am heard speaking in tongues, I stand up for it because that's what I believe in. But I'm not going to get out there and start screaming to the top of my lungs to prove to you that I am. I don't have anything to prove to you. I can whisper in tongues as loud as I can scream it. 
And God hears it all the same. So let that embarrassment evaporate in your life. And don't judge yourself by what so-and-so used to do in the old church on 4th Street when they used to holler out and say things. And, you know, you got to be real careful with these types of things. <laughs> there was a... I'm going to preach this on another occasion, but I was going to start off this week with it, but it's... I'm not going to. I'll do it another time. It's when the Israelites lost the ark in 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter. And um, the lady's name was Phineas, I believe. Hop, no, it was the sons. The sons were named Hophni and Phineas. And, um, and they both died when they were fighting the Philistines. And then the wife was expecting and for one of these sons, they were the sons of Eli, and one of them, they named him Ichabod. And Ichabod means the glory has departed. Now, you got to get your guard up just a little bit because I'm about to turn it, all right, to show you something. But there's a reason why I'm telling you this. is because just because somebody says that they have the Holy Ghost does not always mean that what they're saying. You've heard prophecies it's not the same as a prophecy from the Old Testament. The New Testament prophetic words, they don't carry the same weight with them as the Old Testament prophecies did. Does everybody understand that? I believe in prophesying. The Bible says we're going to prophesy, but everybody in here, get your guard up just a little bit because there was. I, this is a true story. This is a true story. So anyway, the child's name was Ichabod. And it's, the mother said, because the glory has departed. And so they wrote Ichabod over the temple. The glory has departed. So anyway, in church, fast forward to our day, probably in the 60s, maybe something like that. I remember my dad telling the story. He almost fell out of his chair. He was laughing so hard. He said they jumped up in the middle of the service because they didn't agree with what the pastor was saying. And they pretended that they were prophesying. And this is what they said. The Lord hath said to write Michelob over this door. What? I think you mean Ichabod. Michelob. <laughs> Michelob is not the same as Ichabod. <laughs> this one happened in another meeting with thousands of people there. Guy gets up, and this is true. He stands up and he says, Yay! Just as Noah led the children of Israel out of the land of bondage. Sat down, and everybody went, that was Moses. He stands up and goes, yay, I meant Moses. Like God made a mistake in the prophecy. You see why people have backed away from certain things? Because we, we've had some crazy stuff happen in church. And so we want to be well-balanced, well-grounded in our theologies. We want to make certain that we're doing things the way that the Scripture says to do it. And so you don't have to stand up and scream out a, a prophecy. You don't have to stand out and scream in tongues. You can whisper that. You can say it. It's just as effective. God hears it all the way. So take the shame off of your prayer life when you are praying. And then there's another thing, too. We forget how important it is to pray in the Spirit. We sought the baptism. We received the baptism. Life goes on, and now you say your prayers, and you've got your prayer list, and you don't make room in it for you to pray in tongues and pray in the Spirit. So why do I need to know that? I know what I'm praying. Yes, but that's the whole point. The Spirit on the inside of you is praying for things that you don't even realize are around you circumstances that you may face, family members that may be going through things that you don't even know how to pray because we don't know how to pray. It's the Spirit of God that makes intercession. And you have got to come to a point where you are filled with the Spirit. You're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You're not embarrassed by praying in the Spirit and that you realize the importance of praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit 
I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh is what it says in chapter 2 verse 17. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and upon my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So do I believe in personal prophecy? Yes. But I believe it has to be treated very respectfully and very carefully. I'll take you just for another moment or two. You still with me this morning? Stay with me for just a little bit longer because this is important. The handling of the anointing of the presence of the Holy Spirit is so important. Now, when the Philistines miss, they, they took the ark. They got it away from the Israelites. Uh, go ahead. Because in the Bible, God smote them all with hemorrhoids. Now, these were three or four Philistine cities that were smote with hemorrhoids because they did not handle. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor. If you don't find the humor in that, because they got they, they, they two cities, two cities. They, the first one, they lost like 70,000 people. Is that a plague or what? Forget COVID. I don't care nothing about COVID. You're dying with the hemorrhoids? Please. That's horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can think of a lot of ways that are horrible to have to die, but that would be one of them. One of the many ways I just would rather not. So anyway, they send it from one city, which was Ashdod. They send it to another one. Then they send it to another one. The third one said, ah, you're not bringing that in here. How would you feel? You know, they come with the Ark of the Covenant in the case of hemorrhoid medicine. <laughs> <laughs> At least somebody in this building thinks that's funny. There ain't enough preparation H, man. You're talking about baby formula on the counter. And you can't get <laughs> You're talking about some mad citizenry. <laughs> you can't get a hold of that. Woo! <laughs> that smarts. <laughs> they finally said, no, we're not. <laughs> you leave me alone. You can fuss at me on the way home, all right? Y'all don't know why I keep, I'm going to look at her. I'm going to put a little, a little cardboard thing in front of her so I don't have to look at her while I'm preaching because I can always see what she's thinking. It's just funny because they, they're like, no, you're not sending that back over here. Now, listen, this is what happened. So the Philistines get a cart, and they make it. They get calves that are still milking. And they put the cart, they put the ark on the cart, and they turned the calves loose. And the calves left their mothers, which that doesn't happen in nature. The calf always stays with its mother because that's where it's getting its food. And they brought, the, they brought it back to Israel. Now fast forward. David says, I want to bring the ark of the covenant into the city. And so they take it and they put it on an ox cart. Not because they were trying to be disrespectful, because that's the only reference they had was what they saw from 1 Samuel. Oh, well, maybe that's how we're supposed to do it, because in all of this, the nation had backslidden so badly that nobody knew how to transport the Ark of the Covenant with the priests and all the, all the ceremony that was supposed to go with that. So when the Israelites took the ark and they put it on the ox cart and David's friend went to hold it to keep it from falling off, it killed him because he mishandled the anointing. Do you understand? It was a bigger statement than this guy just did something wrong and God was mad at him. No, he was mishandling something that was holy. Something that was forbidden. Don't do that. And when you're, mm, I'm going to preach this just a second. When you are the children of God and you mishandle the Holy Ghost, that's different than when you're some Philistine out in the world mishandling it. If you're some non-believer, you don't know any better, and you put the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart, you get away with that. But when you get over here in church and you start disrespecting the Holy Ghost and you disrespect the anointing and you disrespect the move of God, that's a different thing in God's opinion. And that's how David's friend lost his life. 
And David <laughs> ripped his clothes and said, how am I supposed to do this? And that's when the priests had to go back and research everything that was supposed to have been done the first time before they could ever bring the ark in. Now, for those of us that hear this right now, do it right. Do it right. Well, I don't know. Then you better research some more. You better study some more. Stop depending on the sermon on Sunday morning from 10 to 1130 to get you through a week. It's not going to do it for anybody. You have got to devour the word. You've got to get into the word. You've got to praise and worship. These are the things that I have learned in the many years that I have been living for the Lord. And the ups and the downs and the ups and the downs of living a Christian life. You find yourself down here sometimes and you go, i got to grab a hold of this and start worshiping and praising and reading my Bible like I'm supposed to do. And you'll be doing great for a while. Then you'll get busy. You'll get mad. You'll get bitter about something. And you'll be down here. And God will come back to you again and say, hey, get back over where you're supposed to be. And you come on back up. How many of you have been living for the Lord for a length of time that you went through discouragement? You went through depression. You just went through some disgusting times that you just didn't feel like it. You didn't feel like it anymore. We've all dealt with that. But in all of the mistakes and all the failures of this life, don't ever let it be that you mishandle the person of the Holy Ghost. Do not disrespect the presence of God. Do not disrespect the anointing. It says this in verse 19 of chapter 2. And I will show wonders in heavens above. Signs in the earth beneath. Blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. Listen to this. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Have you ever seen a lunar eclipse? Have you ever seen pictures of that? Or a solar eclipse? Have you seen the blood moon that has appeared in the sky in recent years? We've had many of them, of at least four or five that we've had, blood moons. It doesn't mean literally the moon will turn into dripping blood. It means it will be darkened red like blood. Well, we're living in that day. I said this a million times, but I, you know, sometimes people don't hear it. And they forget about it. And then I say it again, and then they remember it. Oh, I don't remember you saying that. Yeah. One time I was asking the Lord about hell and the lake of fire. And he said, go outside. And I walked out in front of my house in Marrero. And I just stood there, and I looked up, and it was a clear day, and the sun was right there. And he said, look up. I looked up. He said, what is that? I said, that's the sun. He said, what does it look like? You've seen pictures of it. I said, it looks like a big lake of fire. He said, well, then why couldn't it be right there? It's been sitting there the whole time. What if it was just that simple? Everybody's always arguing about it. Oh, no. How is that ever going to be a lake of fire? It's in the science books. You can look it up online. It might not be the lake of fire, but it is one. And there's a, mo- <laughs> there's a whole lot more of them out there than we ever thought, huh? All the stars of the heaven. And then what about this bottomless pit where Jesus said they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? What is that? Sounds a lot like a black hole in science. I just saw a picture of one that just published maybe a month ago. They put it in all the magazines. They put it up. Is it the first one that they could really identify as? And there it is. It's got such a gravitational pull to it that it could pull a star into it and snuff it out. You won't even know it's there. Oh, you mean that there's the possibility that everything that the Bible says is true? That one day there will be no more sun and God himself shall be the light of the city? Oh. Huh. When you think about where the devil's headed, it's there. This is not something I'm making up anymore. I've got, I, I, I just happened to bring the book with me this morning because it was in, in my bag with me about uh, physics. And it starts telling you all the things that you can do. The, the, uh, I believe his, his last name was Young. It was 1810. He split uh, an electron and it went around and rejoined on the other side 
of the experiment that he was doing, and it says, in this, this, is a, this is a science book. This is not the Bible. It says you can be in two places at the same time. People tell me all the time, well, how can God be with you, and how can he be with you, and how can he be with you? If you can prove it in 1810 in a science project, then I'm pretty sure the one who came up with it, the God of the universe, can be everywhere all at the same time. Amazing, isn't it? When you start looking at the scientific facts, angels, they, they, they move at the speed of light. The Bible says that they are light bearers. Do you know how fast that is? 282,000 miles a second. That's insane. The earth is spinning, I think, at 186,000 miles per hour right now. Isn't that amazing to you? You can look it up. I know some of y'all are going, what? Yeah, I've preached this before. I should have brought those notes, and then I'd have it all accurate for you. But I like to make you go look it up. <laughs> and, uh, and I know you're doing it. Yeah, that means that uh, Michael the Archangel can get back and forth from here and around the world seven times in one second. So don't tell me he can't get to Moscow and Washington, D.C., and get into all these places all that fast. And that's not even God. That's a creation. That's an angel. See, when we get to heaven, aren't you excited about this? Because when the rapture of the church takes place, this is what it says about us. It says, when I see Jesus, when I stand before him, I shall be like him. For I shall see him as he is. That's what's about to happen for every one of us. When I see Jesus, I'm not just going to have what Michael the archangel can do. I'm going to be doing the works that Jesus did and even greater works. Wait, I'm supposed to do that now. I'm supposed to be doing the greater works even now, but through the person of Christ, through the power of God and the presence of the Holy Ghost. That's how we're able to do these things. I've seen it happen. I wish it happened more and more regularly, but I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. People raised from the dead. Amazing. It happened to me one time in my life. And I've told you about it before, so I'm not going to keep on telling the same story to you. But I've, it happened one time, and the only reason it happened was because I didn't know the guy was dead. I walked in and grabbed him by the hand, and all the nursing staff was standing around him. I said, what are y'all doing? And I, the doctors were standing there, and I picked him up, and his eyes popped open, and he looked at me. He still comes to church. That's back over there. Put him back on the gurney, and he didn't tell me for a few months. He said, you didn't know I was dead, huh? <laughs> I don't know if I would have had the faith for it. If he would have been dead, I would have started singing Amazing Grace. That's what you sing at all the funerals, right? I do. I sing Amazing Grace at all the funerals. I, I, my carnality would have got in the way of the whole thing. But because I didn't know any better. Boy, if we just didn't know any better sometimes, huh? If we'd just be ignorant, kind of like the disciples in the third chapter when they walked into the temple and there was a man that was crippled and the disciples looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Peter grabbed him by the arm and yanked him to his feet. His feet and ankle bones received strength and he went hopping and leaping and praising God into the temple. You want to know he was so excited? He had never been in the temple. He was lame. They would not let him in. He was imperfect. He was unclean. He could not go into the temple. And his first time was right after he was healed in the name of Jesus. See, Jesus still does those kinds of things. He'll do them for you. He'll save your family. Believe. He'll heal your body. Believe. He'll set you free. Believe. He'll restore your life. Believe, believe. Come to that place where you believe again. Where you're tired of all the foolishness that the world is throwing at you, all the politics. Oh, good night. And then the discouragement and everything in the, all that stuff. Throw that all out the window for a day or two. And see if you're not a happier person when you just start believing. I don't know where this is going to take me, but I believe.
still believe. Come on and bow your heads with me right now. Still believe. Thank you, Jesus. Say this simple little prayer with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I need a Savior. I believe upon Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind. I speak Jesus. Just say his name right now, Jesus. today.
Give the Lord a good praise offering right now. Just tell him that you love him. Welcome. Another song that goes like that. How many of you have a loved one maybe that's just lost? And it doesn't mean they never went to church or never said the sinner's prayer. They just lost their way somehow. I want you to hold your hand up for me real quick. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus for all those that have just lost their way. That may have been lost all along or maybe they were coming to church and they just lost their way in all the trouble of this life. I lift them up to you right now, God. In the name of Jesus and by your power, God, go to them now by your power. Go to them right now. Go and get them, Father, and bring them home. Bring them home. Every person that has a sickness, Father, we pray for them right now. In the name of Jesus. Sickness, infirmity, and disease have to bow to the name of Jesus. Bow to the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let him 
You just want to feel encouraged when you walk out of here today in the name of Jesus. Let's, let's pray for that right now. Heavenly Father, the many discouragements of this life, Lord, that we already had, not including all the crazy that's going on right now. So we put it all before your throne. We ask for the Holy Ghost to encourage every single person right now. The Holy Ghost to encourage every single person. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Encouragement. Encouragement. Thank you, Jesus. I believe God's going to send you some divine encouragement this morning. You're going to know your faith is going to be renewed. Your strength is going to, it's going to be renewed like the eagles. You're going to walk out of here encouraged and challenged and blessed. Write you out a fresh prayer list. Write a few things down. You don't have to make a three-page prayer list. Just put a few things down in the front of your Bible on an index card and say, I'm going to believe God for this. I'm going to start believing again. And let this be the day of Pentecost for you. Let it be your own personal day of Pentecost today. Ushers, if you would come, we're going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Thank you for the faithfulness of the congregation. You just being faithful. and let, Let's get through all this junk. Amen? Let's just get through all this junk. Let's just be found faithful in the hard times. He said if we're going to be found faithful in the good times and the bad times, in the little and in much, be found faithful today. And I know that God's going to bless you. He's going to bless me. He's going to keep this church rolling right along in the name of Jesus all the way up to the rapture in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you'll reach down and bless this offering. Let it be more than enough to meet the needs of the congregation. Touch those who are at home right now. Speak to their hearts that they'll give online to help the ministry flourish and be all that it's supposed to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone said in agreement? Amen. God bless you as you give this morning. Joanna, if you'd come up and make some announcements, please. Uh, I know that she's going to be talking to you about the women's uh, revival this coming week. It's going to be a great time. You don't want to miss it. Now, I won't take her thunder by making her announcement. Come on, boy. Good morning. Um, we have, I, I gave these out this morning. This is really important. Um, if you didn't get one, it's a Pray for our America that starts tomorrow, June 5th through July 4th. Each day, it gives something that we're praying for. Um, if you didn't get one, I don't have any, but I will post every day on the God's House Facebook page what we are praying for. So if we can just all come together and pray for our, our nation, our country, our leaders, our teachers, our schools, our kids, our families. Um, there's so much power in prayer. Um, Friday night, we have our Women's Revival Night at 6 p.m. with Julie White. If so please, if you can be in attendance, ladies, I know it's going to be a powerful night. And also on the 25th, we have our ladies paint day. And I have a sign-up sheet out front. You can sign up there. Um, it's $15 per lady. The end of the sign-up will be on the 19th. Um, and it's going to be a great time of just fellowship, just ladies getting together and fellowshipping. And that's all I have. <laughs> she closes her announcements like she closes her sermons. That's it. <laughs> um, I'm so thankful that God has brought you here today. And those of you that have tuned in, I hope you enjoyed what the word of God was. I know we laughed a little bit. I know I said some things that might have been out there on the edge, but somebody better say something pretty quick. Amen. Somebody better say something pretty quick. Because when our nation has fallen to a place that we can't tell the difference between men and women, we are in bad, bad shape. And, um, and we're not going to let that be. Our church never said anything about it. We're going we're gonna to say something about that. And I'm not, see, this is the thing. I'm, I'm not preaching about your morality. I'm preaching about biology. 
That's not about your morality. I didn't tell you one way or another because I think it's just as big a sin for somebody to commit adultery as it is for anything else. I think it's fornicate. All the, all of them are listed in there, and you know, sometimes the Christian world they want you to pick on one because they don't like that one. Well, I pick on all of them. I'm guilty of a few of them. So are you. That's why the blood of Jesus is. I know I have nothing I want to say. <laughs> Everything's good. Y'all are like, oh no, no, I don't have nothing to say except dismiss you. We got a good church. We got good people all around us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Tell y'all off mic. All right. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll protect us and keep us. Don't let danger or harm come near us or our families. Give us a wonderful, wonderful day today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone said in agreement. Amen. God bless you. God bless all of you out there as well.